Hey, thank you for joining our online experience. We'd love to hear your story of how God has moved in your life. You can email us at amen at revyourlife.com. And if you'd like to support this ministry financially, it's as simple as a click. Just head over to revgive.com. Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you in person very soon. Please enjoy today's message. Cool. Isn't it awesome that half the room left when we dismissed the student ministry? That's really good. That means there are a lot of students here. I love it. I love what God's doing through the mix. So glad that y'all are here first Wednesday. First Wednesday, I know you might be thinking it's the same thing as the weekend. It sort of is, but it's sort of not. I try to be a little looser, try to talk about a little bit different kind of stuff on Wednesdays, but we're doing this series right now. Hopefully you all know about it called I Don't Know What I Believe, and I pulled it from bumper stickers. Are you all familiar with the concept yet? All right, good. So I don't have to get into it, but you know, I see people with conflicting stickers on their car all the time. And I've always thought that that's kind of funny. It always made me go, this person, I don't really know what they believe. And I think we all have moments in our faith, especially the older we get, where we realize, well, maybe I don't know as much as I thought I knew. Have you had a moment like this? The older I get, I joked week one, the more I realize that I don't know much at all. (laughs) And so um, I just think it's a good a good place to be in, you know, that mode of, of learning. And, and so week one, what do we talk about? We talked about how it's not really what you believe in that matters most anyway if you're a Christian, but it's about who you believe in, right? For us, the thing that sets us apart makes us different than any other belief system or religion out there is that we don't believe in a what. We believe in a person, a person named Jesus Christ. And then this past weekend, um, we talked about how that person we believe in, Jesus, the who, shapes who we are becoming. So we covered salvation. Y'all remember that? We covered sanctification. And today I'm going to give you the extra message because every time we do a series, I've got like 10 more messages. Okay. I've always got way too much. And I I always, you know, I'm excited to start something new, but hate to see the other thing go because I'm never quite done. So I just thought I'm going to give them the extra one at first Wednesday. So y'all get to be the special people who hear the extra one. And the S thing that I want to talk about tonight is sound teaching. And we don't have a note sheet for you, but Grab some paper or a pen or get your phone out, open up your little notes or your email or whatever, and take some notes. We've been going to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want to read it again. Here's what it says. He, Jesus, has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, amen, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it's now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death, right? And has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom, right? Not what. I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Now here's what I'll focus on this evening for a few minutes with you. What you heard from me Keep as the pattern, everybody say pattern, of sound teaching, you see it? With faith and love in Christ Jesus, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Let's pray. God, thank you that the Holy Spirit lives in us. And so we have the ability to guard that which you have given us with faith with love, with trust in who you are, not a bunch of things or what's, but a person, a person named Jesus Christ who changed everything for us forever. Would you teach us a minute about sound teaching tonight and how big of a role it plays in knowing what we believe? In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, so here's what I want to give you tonight. I've been trying to give you like one phrase that sums up the whole sermon, and that phrase tonight is that who you hear will determine who you believe. Who you hear will determine who you believe. Now, who here loves to learn? Put your hand up. What do you lo- somebody tell me, what do you love to learn about? Not all at once. <laughs> Jesus, give me a break, Justin. <laughs> Christina, your hand is up. What do you love learning about? Music, that's awesome. Somebody else over here? Huh? People. I like that. Somebody in the back. Don't be scared. History. Oh, that's good. What kind of history? All kinds. I like Texas history. 
Surprise, surprise. Yes, sir. Politics, leave. No, I'm kidding. I'm just going to... Politics. I, no, a lot of people, I mean, especially right now, right? This is like a good season for you. You're getting to learn a lot of stuff, aren't you? Y'all have heard my joke about politics, right? You, you haven't? Politics? You don't know what politics is? It's the, the phrase poly meaning many and ticks meaning blood-sucking insects. That's, sorry. Hey, you're going to love this. We're going to do a series starting in May called America. And I got a message written already that I'm going to share called Five Things I Want to Say to Our Next President. All right, but let me get back on topic. So, you love to learn. Anyone who didn't love, uh, love to learn, anyone who didn't raise their hand, you're, you're the kid that liked to beat up the learners in high school, right? That was the rest of you, okay? I love to learn. Leaders or learners? If I've learned anything since becoming a leader, it's that I've got to always be learning. I've always got to be learning. I've got to keep on learning and some fun stuff I've gotten to learn in my life, I, I used to build houses. So um, I actually framed all the walls in this place with a team of guys from the church. Kind of a cool thing God did. I, I didn't know back then why I was learning that, but now I know why I, I got to learn that. Uh, my son and I, we built a tree house last week. And I wouldn't have known how to do that if I had never learned about building houses. Um, when I gave my life to Christ, I learned a lot about my faith really, really fast. Anybody remember those early days when you're just thirsty and it's like jet fuel, right? You're just learning fast. I remember when I went to college to get my degree and study the Bible and I learned on a, on a new level, really, about who God was and some of the history behind it and, you know, a lot about the church that I did not know. And um, today I like to learn about people, like Michelle said. I, I love to learn about you guys, about Revolution Church. I, I love to learn about church in general. I used to collect baseball cards as a kid. I collect church now. I know that sounds weird, but like when I go to church, I'm snapping pictures. I'm calling the pastor. I'm learning everything I can from that church. Um, but you know what I love even more than learning? I love taking what I got to learn and living it out. Doesn't, isn't that where it's really fun? When you get to start living out what you learn. And as much as I love to learn, I remember this one guy in high school. His name was Sean. And Sean, if you're here, I love you. Um, <laughs> he's not here. Don't worry. Uh, this guy, he was one of those like over-the-top learners. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Like he literally had no life. I'm convinced this dude listened to cassette tapes on learning things as he slept. Like if you don't know what a cassette tape is, you talk to me after church. I'll tell you. And uh, there might be people here who don't know. Hey, come on. Um, that was all this guy cared about. Like, he, he was so into learning that he didn't even have a social life. It was kind of sad. And I remember trying to kind of be become his friend and because I always cared about people. That's kind of who I was in school. And um, he was just so shut off to the world around him. And he had this attitude that all this knowledge he had gained, it just sort of puffed him up. It kind of made him proud. And he never lived any of it out. So he knew a lot, but he never did anything with all this stuff that he knew. And I meet a lot of Christians who are like that. They think that Christianity is always only ever about being in learning mode. Like, I'm a Christian now. It's my job to just learn about Jesus, and that's it. And don't get me wrong. Learning is super important. Amen? It's super important. I mean, hopefully every day you're learning more about who he is and who you are in Christ, but but isn't faith more about the living aspect than it is about the learning aspect? I think so. And I didn't come up with that. I read Jesus talking about it. John chapter 5, Jesus is talking to some learners, some theologians, some Jewish guys that, that all they cared about was learning. All they cared about was who could quote the most scripture and who knew all the Jewish laws by heart and He's kind of letting them have it. And look at what he says. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think life is all about just learning. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus is telling us something about life. He's telling us you can't learn your way through every issue. That there's some issues you're going to have to live your way through. Amen? Amen. That you're going to have to live through some stuff. But before we started Revolution Church, I was an executive pastor at a church in the Austin area called the Connection Church. Uh, Dr. Cole Phillips, he spoke here a couple times. Some of you remember him as a pastor there. And I remember when I met Pastor Cole, I just had such a deep respect for the man 
because he had a, a very good understanding of God's word, but also because I had never met anyone like him who lived out everything he understood so well. I remember when I first met him trying to kind of shoot holes in it, see if I get him to trip up or whatever. I couldn't do it. Dude was a rock. Now, we all have our moments, but I mean, he just understood how to live his, his faith out. I, I was blown away by his ability to apply the word of God. Anybody know somebody like this? Aren't those the people you want to be more like? It's the same thing that attracted me so much to my wife. When I met her, she was just so good at living out her faith. Her faith was, was vibrant. You could just see it in her. And, and what Cole and, and my wife had that I didn't have at the time was they had understood how to take their faith from just their head down to their heart. And also to their hands, like I talked about with Marcus volunteering a while ago. And these people taught me this. And most of the Christians that I admire, it's not because they pastor a really big church. It's not because they've been a Christian so much longer than me. Some of them have been Christians shorter amount of time than me. It's not because they have the biggest collection of funny Jesus t-shirts, okay? Or no more Christian songs, it's just that they live their faith out. They, they, just, they just have this passion to live it out, what they, what they believe. See, a lot of us, I think we think Christianity is about how much you know in your head, but, but we got to make the shift, and we got to understand it's actually about what you live. A lot of Christians make a, a lifelong struggle out of life to, to move their faith from here to here and here. And this is what Jesus has called us to do. Um, I took a class in college because it was required. I had to have one science credit. And I guess they want guys studying the Bible to remember there's a thing called science or whatever. But, and the only one offered that semester was botany. I hated it so much, y'all. It's the only class I ever got worse than a B in in my entire schooling history. I got a, a, a barely C. Let's call it that, okay? Let's protect my innocence. I mean, I barely squeezed by. And... Um, it, just to show you how bad I was at this, like, I'm lucky I even remembered to call it botany. I usually call it herbology. And people make fun of me, and they're like, what is that, Zach? Uh, the study of herb? What are you talking about? It, seriously, that's how bad I was at this. And I remember this test one time. I was so stressed out. I think it was the final. And I knew if I didn't, you know, make a certain grade, I wouldn't pass the class. I'd have to take another science class. I definitely didn't want to do that just because my brain doesn't really work with chemistry and science and cutting frogs up and stuff. I think something wrong with you people, but whatever. You got your thing. I got mine. So um, I studied and I crammed all night and I must have drank, you know, 13 Red Bulls. And I go to class and I'm like, anyone ever take a test like that? And I sit down to take the test and I'm just so stressed out. And the teacher, the professor, she goes... All right, class, remember, this is an open book test. <laughs> I was so mad. Somehow I had missed that. I think I cussed out loud right there. I was so mad. And so I get the book out and, you know, I finally chill out a little bit. And I, but I invested all that time in this test. And then I realized it's, it's an open book test. It, here's the best part. I still missed three questions somehow. I don't know how. That's how bad I was at the botany thing. But isn't it true that life has a way of putting us through some tests? In fact, most of you probably are in a test of some sort right now. It might not be the worst test you've ever experienced, but you're probably in some stage of testing right now. And in life, you can't always cram and you can't always prepare and you can't always learn everything you need to know for that test. But what I want to encourage you with is that when you're a Christ follower, the book has been opened up and every test in life is an open book test, is it not? Every test is an open book test. So for us, we got to remember that that our faith is not about studying in the library of life. It's about living in the lab of life. See, in botany, we moved from class time and lecture time and study time and test time to lab time. And lab time, I still wasn't very good at it. Most of my plants died pretty quick, but I could deal with it because I got to get in there and get my hands in it and work with it and get them dirty. And, and I just learned better that way. Life is kind of like that. It's about the lab of life. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, this is Paul, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. 
Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now, in Jesus' day and age, it wasn't really much different than today. People would adopt things from all these different religions that they liked. So they'd go, oh, well, I like that part of that religion, but not those other parts. So I'll take that part that I like, and look at the, oh, what's this one over here? I'll take this part of this one right here. Kind of like the bumper stickers that we see on the cars, right? This is what people were, were doing back then. They were just mixing up these different religions, and they were building their lives on a foundation of false teaching and religious systems rather than holding on to the faith. Even people who said they were Christ followers were struggling with this. Instead of holding on to the faith and love offered through a person named Jesus. And I think we're all so susceptible to this in that lab of life, are we not? We're so susceptible to it. And, and Paul is saying this, I think, because he knows Timothy is going to face multiple voices grasping for his attention. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, we live in a day and age where there's more voices than ever. And I think Paul lists these three different tests right here that life will bring us, that we're all going to face in some way or another. And he's warning Timothy, hey, here's... Here's the test, but he's also encouraging him and saying, but don't worry, it's an open book test and you're going to pass it. So I want to give you these three tests because I think it'll help you. Test number one is this, whose voice will you listen to? Whose voice will you ultimately listen to in life? Paul said, what you heard from me. Now, Timothy heard a lot from Paul over the years. Timothy watched Paul set up all these churches. Timothy watched Paul get beaten several times. Timothy saw Paul persecuted. He watched Paul go to Jerusalem and work through some church junk. And, and Timothy got these letters from Paul. Paul was a primary voice, Paul, y'all, for Timothy, all right? A primary voice for him. How about you? Whose voice will you listen to? Because life brings tons of voices, especially today where every idiot has a blog and a social media account, okay? And anyone can post anything to YouTube if they have a cell phone and make it look really, really good and sound amazing, okay? And sometimes what happens is in the middle of all the endless screaming voices, we grab some stuff that maybe we don't need to grab, and then we are brought to a place where we go, wow, I don't know what I believe anymore. And oftentimes it's so unnecessary, and it's brought just because we're listening to the wrong voice. We're embracing the wrong voice. And, and it's hard because the, the voices are loud, right? I mean, they are, they are so loud, screaming for our attention, getting us off track, find ourselves listening and responding to voices in life rather than listening and responding to God's voice, the creator of life. In my lab of life, I want to listen to the one who created this life. And it, it makes me think of this kid that Started coming to Revolution Church about three years ago. He showed up and he's so confused. And back then, the church wasn't quite as big. I could meet with more people and I got to sit down and I got to talk with this kid. We didn't have a student ministry at the time either. That's fairly new around here. And, and I started talking to him and, and he said that he, he kind of sort of believed in God at one point and you know, he, he thought he was making progress and maybe going to give his life to Christ. But then the guys he was hanging out with sent him a link to a YouTube video. I was like, well, tell me about this YouTube video. So he told me all about it, and, and he was so convinced that everything in this eight-minute YouTube video about how God is not real was actually the truth, and part of his reasoning was, one, that his friends are good guys that he likes and sent it to him, and two, that 5,000 people had watched it. <laughs> I was like, wow, 5,000 people watched it, man. And this kid, he, he was always kind of a you know, a little rebellious. Some of you understand that. You know, you, you kind of just were bent that way or whatever. You kind of like being a little rebellious. And, and what I was ultimately able to help this, this guy realize is that he was actually not rebellious at all. He was just the average of his five closest friends. He was just doing exactly what they do, you know. And I was able to help him kind of work through some of his questions and he started to grasp and understand the reason he was doing drugs. I forgot to mention that. The reason he was making really bad decisions in life, the reason he was running from God was because he just had the wrong voices speaking to him all the time. And one day he said, I, I'm going to be a real rebel now, Zach. I'm going to embrace the message of Jesus. And I got to lead him to Christ right there in Starbucks that day. And his life has been forever changed eternally, but also right here, right now. Why? Because he, he started listening 
to the right voice, the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's the right voice. He got the right voice and it changed everything. What voices do you have? We get voices from all over the place. Maybe you're raised in a family where you weren't affirmed very much. It's not that they were really mean to you or anything, but you just don't feel like they really believed in you. Or, or maybe you had somebody in, in high school that called you something or said something about you or started some nasty rumor about you or whatever. Or maybe there's somebody in the workplace that's always talking down to you and making that job more difficult for you. Ultimately, you're feeling like you're a nobody and you'll never be anything. Just realize... As a Christ follower, you get to choose the voice that will be the ultimate in your life in directing you. And your choice is to listen to God's voice or some other voice. It's your choice. And what we hear often determines what we do. So the right voices are so important. And this is one of the most major things that I see new Christians do that, that drags them backwards and, and out of the church almost as quickly as they got in to a relationship with Jesus. It's that they don't have the right voices in their life. And so they give their life to Christ, but they never take any other steps like getting some other friends. You don't have to tell your old friends that are still going to the club and backing that thing up, see you later, you guys are the devil. You don't have to do that. But maybe they don't need to be the primary voice in your life, Right? And so who's that primary voice? And then think of this, and, and this is what's got to ground you all the time. We kind of hit on it last week, but God says you're created in his image, right? You know what that means? It means you're valuable. It means you have intrinsic value. And then think about Jesus. What did he do? He left his throne in heaven to come down here to earth to radically rescue you and me. That shows that your worth, your value is infinite. His love for you. Which voices are you going to embrace? Which voices are you going to reject? Test number two, what pattern will you live by? What pattern will you live by? Because the right voices, one way you'll know you have the right voices is the pattern will be right. You'll start to see some new patterns in your life. My, my wife sews. Any other lady sew? It's kind of a lost thing. Not many do it anymore, but she likes to sew, and she'll go to Hobby Lobby, and she'll look at patterns for two hours. Drives me crazy. Don't tell her I said that. I mean, she'll just look at patterns forever. She's looking for the perfect pattern, right? But then she finds that perfect pattern, and it's easy, she says. Looks like rocket science to me because I ain't ever learned anything about it. I got no sewing voices in my life. But she knows enough about it, and she just follows the pattern, and then boom, out comes this amazing dress or whatever it is that she's making. This is what Paul was to Timothy. He was the right pattern. Why was he the right pattern? Because Paul patterned his life after Jesus Christ. It wasn't that Paul was so awesome. In fact, one time Paul wrote to Timothy, I'm the chief of sinners, Timothy. He didn't say, I'm so awesome, you should make me your pattern. I should be the one you pattern after. No, he said, he said I'm the chief of sinners. Yet he was humble, he was faithful, he was enduring. And, and no matter what circumstance you put Paul in, it just seemed like he passed the test with flying colors. He's a great person to pattern after. Why? Because ultimately he loved Jesus. In 2 Timothy 4, he wrote this to Timothy. The time for my departure is near. He knows he's about to die. He says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. But then look at what he says. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. See, he's not taking credit. He's giving Jesus the credit, which the Lord, not me, the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Paul says, I'm looking forward to my reward and I'm confident that it's a seat in heaven, but it's not based on my performance or my status or how great of a pattern I am. It's based off that or he who, which, uh, who I have patterned my life after. It's based off the fact that I patterned my life after Jesus Christ. So Timothy, what pattern are you living by? And it's the same question we've got to answer. Are you living your life by the pattern of who the world says you should be and who you are or by the pattern of who Christ says you are? Which one is it? In so many ways, our, our lives, they, they hinge on our ability to, to translate our understanding of Jesus into a, a new way to be human, right? Into a distinct way of living. For instance, Jesus says, you know, be generous to others. The world says, no, 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 get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can, don't share any of it, right? That's what the world says. Jesus says, forgive 70 times 7, infinitely. Drop the F-bomb, forgiveness, as many times as it takes. Just keep on forgiving and forgiving. And for the, the world says, why you let him do you like that? Hold a grudge. Lord it over him. Jesus says, live revolutionary faith. 
The world says, just go and do what feels good. So you got to choose what pattern you will live by. And the question for us here is when people look at you, do, do they see the pattern of Jesus? Third test, what passion will you live for? What passion will you live for? I'm going to read Paul again. First Timothy. I'm sorry, Second Timothy. Is it First Timothy? Second Timothy. I should know that by now. Chapter one. Sorry, preacher's not perfect. Here we go. <laughs> says, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. There's a pattern. With faith and love, there's the passion. In Christ Jesus. Guard. Everybody say guard. guard. Do you guard things that you're not passionate about? Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it how? With faith and love in Christ Jesus. You guard what you're passionate about. But how do we do that? How do we guard what we're passionate about with faith and love in Christ Jesus? It starts by remembering that our faith is a lot less about what we believe and a lot more about who we believe in and how we are to be devoted to that who that we believe in. To be devoted to him, we got to be passionate, right, about our relationship with him and who he is in our life. To be passionate about, about who he is, that means he's got to be the primary voice in our life. What's your passion in life? One time, some guys asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, it's easy, love God and love others. Love God and love people. Love God and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is trying to get them to engage their heart, right? Not just their hands, not just their head. He, he's trying to get them passionate about God and about people. And the greatest learning experience for me in my life so far about passion has been being a, a dad. A dad. A parent. How many parents are in here? It looks like there's a lot of parents. Okay, a lot of parents in here. Parents, um, have you ever had a perfect season as a parent? No? I actually have. You want to hear about it? I remember I had a perfect season as a parent. It was when my first kid, Cooper, my son, was still in his mother's womb. I was a great dad. I was amazing. Oh, my gosh. And then Cooper made his entrance into the world, and the doctor was holding these scissors, and he said, hey, you want to cut the cord? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'll do it. And he, he hands me the scissors, and I'm not kidding. I start to go like this, and I guess it was her vantage point or something or the fact that she had just pushed out a baby. Amber goes, don't cut his toes off. <laughs> she screamed that right there. Everybody jumped. I jumped. I was like, I was doing fine. Now I'm all stressed out that I'm going to cut the kid's toes off. I'm going to give him a big scar across his abdomen or something. 16 years later, he's in the locker room after the football game. Whoa, what happened to you, dude? Oh, my dad had these scissors. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm freaking out, right? And finally, the doctor kind of holds it, and I get steady again, and I cut the cord. And I was so exhausted after that delivery, y'all. <laughs> wow, that's tough. Hard work. I had to go rest. I like that the ladies laughed at that. That's good. But see, ever since then, parenting has been a struggle for me. But that was a good season while it lasted. All two minutes of it, it was glorious. And then I remember they handed him to me. And he was born five and a half weeks early. His lungs weren't fully formed. He had some problems. We knew we were going to be in the hospital a, a while and, and have to watch him struggle some. And they handed him to me, and I knew I wasn't going to get to hold him long and was overwhelmed with this crazy sense of inadequacy, knowing, wow, all the parenting books I read and the classes that I took, Daddy and Me and all this stuff, like, it helped me a little bit, but now it's time to go into the lab the lab just started. And I remember thinking there was no way I would have been able to fully prepare for this. But then a split second later, I remember as I was praying the first time ever holding my son, I remember at the same time as I was feeling all this inadequacy and, and worried and scared, I felt this other thing also rising up inside of me for my son. It was passion. Because I remember thinking, it doesn't matter that I don't know anything. I love this little boy so much, we're going to make it. 
Even, I, even if I get it wrong a thousand times year one, we're going to be okay. Because I got so much love for him. I got so much faith that God's going to do something great for him. As long as I get to hold him, as long as I get to be his dad, we're going to be good. And then five years later, we had a little girl. That was like a thousand times worse, y'all. I mean, I just was melting that time. And here's what I want to tell you about that, and then I'll be done. Our Heavenly Father, He created us. And when He did, initially, He said, I got a, I got a rule. Don't eat from that one tree. And we blew that one, right? So then He gives the law to Moses. It's like 600 and something rules. And we blew that one. He sends Elijah up Mount Carmel to reveal his great power. We fail that test. We, we forget how powerful he is. And we could go on and on and on. And, and I would say to this day, that sinful, dead, dying part of us that's not the truth about us anymore if we're in Christ um, kind of makes us inherently suspicious to some degree of God's word. Have you ever felt that tension? Where sometimes you go, well, I don't know what I believe now. And, and, and it makes us so susceptible to all of these abundant life robbing beliefs and opinions out there that are surrounding us all the time, screaming for our attention. But the heart of our God, the passion of our God, it's so good, it's so perfect that even when we fail a thousand times, he pursues us with his passion because he loves us anyway. So we send Jesus Christ to die on a cross for us, amen? And so God decided to take the word it's one of the nicknames for Jesus. The word, right? The law, the learning, the knowledge from heaven and make it flesh. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Why did God do that? He did it so that we could not only know about him, but so that we could actually know him personally and embrace his voice and hear his voice and that he would be with us in the middle of those deep dark seasons of life but also on the mountaintops and everything in between and so I came to tell you tonight that who you hear will determine in so many ways who you believe in and that Christianity is not about what you believe in it's about who you believe in his name is Jesus it's not primarily about learning how to live that's not what Christianity was ever intended to be it's about listening to his voice and moving from learning to, to a place where you are living with Jesus because check this out there are so many voices out there right but only one voice one voice can bring life it's the voice of Jesus Christ. So let's hear our voice. Let's hear his voice resonated as we speak. Let's not just hear his voice. Let's speak. Let's, let's be his voice. Amen? Let's be his hands and his feet as we live our life based upon the solid rock, the foundation, Christ Jesus. Let's build our faith. Let's, let's, let's trust him. Let's, let's remember it's about a person, not about a bunch of stuff. Let's learn about the stuff. Let's learn about the what. Let's learn more of the things and more of the verses and, and all of that. But above all else, let's press into a person. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I just want to pray like this. Jesus, thank you that you passed the test for us. Life's going to bring us these tests. But you finished the work. You already passed every one of them. And we get your perfection now if we are in Christ. So for us, every test is open book. All we do is focus on your faith and your love. And as we do that, we ask you to bring passion into our lives, into our hearts. We ask you to bring us the right patterns to live our life by, the right voices that we need to listen to. Sometimes that's going to be a person, a friend, a, a figure who's further along in their faith and understands more about who you are than us. Sometimes it's going to be somebody that we need to love on and mentor. Sometimes it might be a parent, a pastor, uh, somebody on staff at our church, a, a youth minister. God, whoever it is, help us to know who those right voices are, those people that have patterned their life after you so we can pattern our life after you so we can see it in action so we can move from, from the learning in the library to the living in the lab would you do that for us Jesus we give you our lives in every way we thank you for a brand new start in Jesus name everybody said 
Amen. All right. Thank you so much.